This video has been made possible through the support of our museum members. To become a member, visit charlesrivermuseum.org slash join. Please subscribe to follow us here on YouTube and hit like if you enjoyed this video. Hello and welcome to Till We Meet Again, a concert by Diane Taraz featuring songs interwoven with historical anecdotes from World War I, performed live in the main gallery of the Charles River Museum of Industry and Innovation. Wars are great disruptors of the natural flow of history, forcing major changes in how people live, how people work, and what they work on. Many legendary local manufacturers prominently featured at the museum were profoundly impacted by the two 20th century world wars, including the W.H. Nichols Company, the Metz Company, and the Waltham Watch Company. They each repurposed their factories and introduced innovative products and technologies to meet urgent needs for wartime production. The popular songs of the Great War, as World War I was first known, are by turns lighthearted, stirring, and poignant, and they help us understand what the average person, here and abroad, was thinking and experiencing during the worldwide upheaval. Ladies and gentlemen, performing her show, Till We Meet Again, musician, lover of history, and great friend of the Charles River Museum, Diane Taraz. Welcome. In 1918, Richard Whiting wrote a tune for a contest at a Detroit movie theater. And uh, his partner, Raymond Egan, uh, didn't think it was very good, so they threw it away. But Whiting's secretary retrieved it and showed it to their boss, music publisher Jerome Remick, who entered it in the contest, and it won. <laughs> and the song was, Till We Meet Again. There's a song in the land of the lily Each sweetheart is heard with a sigh Over high garden walls this sweet echo falls As a soldier boy whispers goodbye Smile the while you kiss me sad adieu disaster that would envelop the world began with two obscure Austrian nobles. On a June day in 1914, Archduke Franz Ferdinand and his wife Sophie rode through the streets of Sarajevo in an open carriage. A man ran up and shot them dead. He was a Bosnian Serb, part of a movement to gain independence for Serbians in Austria. 
and the Austro-Hungarian Empire used the deaths as an excuse to declare war on a tiny nation that had bothered them for years. Then, as now, Russia considered Serbs their Slavic little brothers and vowed to defend them, declaring war on Austria. Throughout August, nations toppled one after another into war. Germany was an ally of Austria, and uh, when Germany invaded Belgium, Britain had to honor its agreement with that small country, though it had little interest, and no treaties with France or Russia. By the end of the month, the allied powers of Russia, France, and Britain faced the central powers of Germany and Austro-Hungary. Smaller countries joined one side or the other. Spain remained neutral. In most places, young men rushed to enlist, cheered on by their communities. Everyone was sure the war would be over quickly, and each side was certain of victory. In Britain, boys as young as 14 enlisted, and recruiters, recruiters slipped them in. Nobody wanted to miss their chance for glory. Many recruits were patriotic, but others were simply eager to escape poverty and gain the security of three squares of meals a day and a break from endless toil in the fields or factories. In August 1914, a correspondent for the Daily Mail reported he had heard an Irish regiment marching to a music hall song written by Jack Judge and Harry Williams in 1912 that focused on just how far away they were from Tipperary, Ireland. Other units picked it up, and soon you could buy sheet music with a cover showing a British soldier named, labeled Tommy Atkins. Brits had been called Tommies since the 1700s. So here we have It's a Long Way to Tipperary, and it has a lot of fun uh, with the classic Irishman and his humor. Up to mighty London came an Irishman one day. As the streets are paved with gold, sure everyone was gay. Singing songs of Piccadilly, Strand and Leicester Square. Till Paddy got excited and he shouted to them there, it's a long soldiers being soldiers, there was a body version of this song that went like this. That's the wrong way to tickle Mary. That's the wrong way to kiss. Don't you know that over here, lad, they like it best like this. Hooray pour les Français. Farewell, Angleterre. We didn't know how to tickle Mary, but we learned how over there. <laughs> That's fun. <clears throat> well, Americans watched in horror as battles dragged on and amazing numbers of people were killed, wounded, missing, or captured. Uh, both sides dug trenches for shelter and from shells that blasted the countryside into treeless desolation. The U.S. peace movement was led by women, churches, and those with roots in the countries involved. President Woodrow Wilson aimed to stay neutral, 
But American banks made huge loans to England and France. Wilson repeatedly sent aides on peace missions to both sides with little effect. By November 1914, the trenches stretched 27 miles. On Christmas Eve, the first beginning months of the war, the Brits heard a song wafting from the German trenches. It was Stille Nacht, Silent Night, sung the way it had been written almost 100 years earlier in 1817. And here's what it sounded like. Stille Nacht, Heilige Nacht, alle schläft einsam wacht, nur das traute Heilige Paar, holte Gnabe im lockten Haar, schlafen himmlische Ruhe. Another part of the front, Germans sent over a chocolate cake and proposed a ceasefire to hold a concert. The British accepted and offered tobacco. Goodwill spread along the lines. The men gathered in no man's land, sharing photos of their families and playing soccer. <clears throat> Frank Richards, one of the British soldiers, recalled, on Christmas morning we stuck up a board with a Merry Christmas on it. The enemy stuck up a similar one. Two of our men jumped on the parapet with their hands over their heads. Two of the Germans done the same, and our two men went to meet them. They shook hands, and then we all got out of the trench. The company commander tried to prevent it, but it was too late. Some of them could speak English, and one said he once worked in Brighton, and he was fed up to the neck with this damned war and would be glad when it was over. We told him he wasn't the only one. They sent over barrels of beer, and we gave them a plum pudding. The offers agreed this truce would end at midnight, but just before midnight, we made up our minds not to commence firing before they did. Mr. Richardson, a young officer who had just joined the battalion, wrote a poem about the Briton and the Bosch meeting in no man's land on Christmas Day. A few days later, it was published in the Times. During Boxing Day, we never fired a shot, and they the same. We were relieved that evening, and when we told the arriving soldiers how we had spent the last couple of days, they said the whole British line had mucked in with the enemy. They also told us the French people had heard about it and were saying nasty things about the British Army. <laughs> Such a truce never happened again. In April 1915, German forces fired more than 150 tons of chlorine gas at two French divisions. And soon after, German shells carried chlorine into British trenches. France and Britain developed their own chemical weapons, and the US also used gas. Future President Harry Truman was captain of a unit that fired gas shells in 1918. Every use of gas was a war crime, violating the 1899 Hague Declaration concerning asphyxiating gases. But both sides used it anyway. Watching the carnage from afar, the American peace movement promoted neutrality with songs on sheet music and on the new talking machines. In 1915, Alfred Bryan wrote words to a melody by Albert Piantadosi, I didn't raise my boy to be a soldier. And this song sold over 700,000 copies in the first eight weeks. Brian uses the old fashioned words uh, musket, not rifle or gun, probably to evoke colonial times. So here's this uh, very popular song at the beginning of the war. Ten million soldiers to the war have gone who may never return again. Ten million mothers 
his heart must break for the ones who died in vain. Heads bowed down in sorrow in her lonely years. I heard a mother murmur through her tears. I didn't raise my boy to be a soldier. I brought him up to be my pride and joy. Who dares to place a musket on his shoulder to shoot some other mother's darling boy? Let nations undertake their future troubles. It's time to lay the sword and gun away. There'd be no war today if mothers all would say, I didn't raise my boy to be a What victory can cheer a mother's heart when she looks at her blighted home? What victory can bring her back all she cared to call her own? Let each mother answer in the year to be, remember that my boy belongs to me. to place a musket on his shoulder to shoot some other mother's darling boy. Let nations arbitrate their future troubles. It's time to lay the sword and gone away. There'd be no war today if mothers all would say, I didn't raise my boy to be a soldier. Isolationism was an American tradition. As a nation of immigrants, it was hard to choose a side. Britain was a natural ally, but in the 1800s, over 7 million people had immigrated to the United States from Germany, more than doubling the population of the country. Even today, the largest ancestry group in the United States is German. In 1914, German atrocities in Belgium made people question the morality of neutrality. Faced with brutally slain women and children, peoples came to see Germany as the aggressor in the war, a mad dog that had to be destroyed for the good of mankind. The nation's 58 million German Americans began to hear slurs, Bosch and Hun. Bosch is French, combining the word for German with the word for blockhead. <laughs> and the Huns, led by the famously fierce Attila, ravaged Europe in the fifth century and ever since have represented wanton destruction. The Justice Department made a list of German aliens, people of German ancestry who were not citizens. They collected the names of some 480,000 and imprisoned over 4,000 in camps on suspicion of supporting Germany. The Red Cross barred people with German last names from joining. School children cut German songs out of their music books. Libraries removed German material and orchestras stopped playing German composers. And many people of German ancestry Americanized their names, changing from Schmidt to Smith or Müller to Miller, and they stopped speaking German in public lest they be attacked. In 1915, the Victor Talking Machine Company issued a recording with, I didn't raise my boy to be a soldier on one side, and on the other, a fascinating song by Irving Berlin, Set in Hell where the devil's son wants to go up above and do some mischief. But the devil tells him, no, no, stay down here, where things are not nearly as bad as up on earth. <laughs> Berlin wrote this song in 1914 at the start of the war. In 1918, at the end, he wrote God Bless America, a much more well-known song. Well, in 1915, a German sub sank the British passenger liner Lusitania 
killing over a thousand people, including several hundred Americans. The ship sank in just 18 minutes after an explosion much too big for a torpedo. Germany said she was carrying munitions for Britain, which made her a valid target. The Lusitania was indeed full of munitions, but that was not proven until years later. And the murder of so many innocent men, women, and children became a symbol of why the war had to be fought. Well, after the Battle of Verdun and the Battle of the Somme killed unbelievable numbers of people and didn't really accomplish anything, uh, in 1916, Wilson campaigned for a second term based on his success at keeping us out of the war. He won and fended off repeated demands to update the army, which was small and equipped only to fight an old-fashioned war. To try and starve Britain into surrender, Germany sent their U-boats, their submarines, and they attacked any vessel approaching British waters. And when they started to sink American merchant ships, Wilson started to push the idea that we had to the enter the war so we could shape the peace and make the world safe for democracy. And when U-boats sank seven U.S. ships, the U.S. declared war finally on April 6, 1917. But the country was not ready. Only 98,000 men were in uniform, and 45,000 of those were overseas. The first recruits had no uniforms or boots and trained with wooden rifles. It took over a year to create an infrastructure and build everything everybody needed, and it took a great deal of money and a host of federal agencies were created with a million employees. And Herbert Hoover oversaw food rationing. And to Hooverize became a common term for making do with less. The Victor Talking Machine Company withdrew its 1915 disc of peace songs, which had sold so well. Alfred Bryan, who wrote, I didn't raise my boy to be a soldier, chose a new melody by Harry Tierney and created a new song, It's Time for Every Boy to Be a Soldier. <laughs> Literally, he changed his tune overnight. And um, it's got a teeny bit of Yankee Doodle in it, and it stresses um, the Gettysburg Address as well. So we've got a little bit of everything to get people to join. Most every fellow has a sweetheart, some little girl with eyes of blue. My daddy also had a sweetheart, and he fought to win her too. There'll come a day when we must pay the price of love and duty, be there staunch and true. It's time for every boy to be a soldier. Strength and courage to the test. It's time to place a musket on his shoulder and wrap the stars and stripes around his breast. It's time to shout those noble words of Lincoln and stand up for the land that gave you birth. That the nation of the people, by the people, for the people, shall not perish from the it. <laughs> a huge propaganda campaign promoted the war with newsreels, articles, and billboards. Tens of thousands of community leaders known as Three Minute Men gave brief scripted speeches at public gatherings. Slackers of all kinds were condemned and harassed, especially if they had German ancestry. <laughs> And George Cohan did his part in 1917 with a rousing song guaranteed to raise enlistments. Whoops, that's not it. There it is. <laughs> Johnny, get your gun, get your gun, get your gun. Take it on the run, on the run, on the run. Hear them call. Such a lad. Tell your sweetheart not to pine, to be proud her boys in line. Over there, over there, send the word, send the word over there that the Yanks are coming, the Yanks are coming, the drums rum tumming everywhere. So prepare. Beware, we'll be over, we're coming 
I left out the tap dancing. <laughs> in 1917, the U.S. drafted four million men, and they began arriving in Europe in the spring of 1918, some 10,000 a day, called doughboys because their brass buttons looked like little dumplings. That's one theory. A joke ran that the doughboys were needed in 1914 but didn't rise until 1917. Of course, American soldiers had names from every land on earth. Robert Lloyd was a song leader for the army and he promoted solidarity with a song called Good Morning, Mr. Zip, Zip, Zip. <laughs> the idea was that you slip a name of any nationality into the zip and you have a patriotic American, no matter what it is. And it mentions uh, Camel cigarettes and Fatimas, another famous brand of cigarette, and uh, the war definitely ran on cigarettes. <laughs> so here's a good morning, Mr. Zip Zip Zip. We come from every quarter from north, south, east, and west to clear the way to freedom for the land we love the best. We've left our occupations and homes so far and near, but when the going's rather rough, we raise the song of cheer. Good morning, Mr. Zip, 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 with your hair cut just as short as mine. Fatima's must. Good morning, Mr. Zip, 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 with your haircut just as short as your haircut, just as short as your haircut, just as short as mine. You see them on the highway, you meet them down the pike, in olive drab and khaki, our soldiers on the hike. And as the column passes, the word goes down. surely looking fine. Good morning, Mr. Zip, 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 with your haircut just as short as mine. Good morning, Mr. Zip, 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 you're surely looking fine. Ashes to ashes and dust to dust, if the camels don't get you, the Fatimas must. Good morning, Mr. Zip, 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 with your haircut just as short as your haircut. Your hair could just as short as mine. <laughs> well, by summer 1918, two million Americans were in France, about half on the front lines. Black regiments fought in French divisions, including the Harlem Hellfighters, who earned the Croix de Guerre. And the Doughboys soon picked up the local slang. Napu meant destroyed, garbling the French for il n'y a plus, or there's no more. Blighty had long been a nickname for Britain, and a blighty wound was one bad enough to get you sent home, but not kill you. Germans hoped for a Heimatschuss, or home shot, to send them home. Behind the lines in France, one could dine upon bombardier fritz, fried potatoes, and oofs or eggs, and plonk or van blanc, cheap white wine. Soldiers ate hard biscuit and bully beef, and rum came in jars labeled SRD, which the soldiers said stood for seldom reaches destination. <laughs> Rancid butter was called axle grease by the Tommies, and wagen schmier, or wagon grease, by the Jerry's. Cynical chaps said the Royal Army Medical Corps, or RAMC, stood for Rob All My Comrades. The RFA, Royal Field Artillery, artillery meant rotten fiddling about. And on the German side, the Volunteer Automobile Corps, or FAK, was dubbed Fart alles kaputt. Everything goes kaput, everything's broken. <laughs> Kaput has entered many languages, meaning completely out of order. Well, here's a popular ditty that expressed the general opinion about the leadership. It's called Forward Joe Soap's Army. 
Joe soap is British rhyming slang for a stooge or a scapegoat. Joe's an average guy, and soap rhymes with dope. And of course, it was set to the venerable hymn tune, Onward, Christian Soldiers. Forward, Joe Soap's army, marching without fear, with our old commander safely in the rear. He boasts and skites from morn till night and thinks he's very brave. But the men who really did the job are dead and in their grave. Forward Joe Soap's army, marching without fear, with our old commander safely in the rear. And another big favorite was Mademoiselle from Armentier, or Hinky Dinky Parlez-vous. The melody dates to the French army in the 1830s. And the original words were about an encounter between an innkeeper's daughter and two German officers. And it became popular again in the Franco-Prussian War of 1870. And in 1918, soldiers at a rest station in Armentier updated it to apply to their current situation. They wrote dozens of verses about the friendliness of the local mademoiselle, who were more than willing to help a soldier relax. There's a very dirty version of this called Three German Officers Cross the Rhine, which I will not sing for you. But here are some of the uh, tidier verses. Mademoiselle from Armentier, parlez-vous. Mademoiselle from Armentier, parlez-vous. Mademoiselle from Armentier, she hasn't been kissed for 40 years. Hinky dinky, parlez-vous. She'll do it for rum, parlez-vous. She'll do it for wine, she'll do it for rum, parlez-vous. She'll do it for wine, she'll do it for rum, and sometimes for chocolate or chewing gum. Hinky dinky, parlez-vous. You might forget the gas and shell, parlez-vous. You might forget the gas and shell, parlez-vous. You might forget the gas and shell, but you never forget the mademoiselle. Hinky dinky, parlez-vous. The colonel got was never there. Hinky dinky parlez-vous. <clears throat> well, since 1915, British soldiers had been marching to a song called Pack Up Your Troubles by George Asaph and Felix Powell, who were brothers. And uh, this was another one that won a song contest, and the, they were delighted to hear thousands of troops singing it on their way to the docks to sail. The brothers made a fortune from recordings by big stars. George became a conscientious objector, and Felix did his bit by entertaining frontline troops. But as Felix toured the trenches, it began to bother him that he was making money by encouraging men to smile, 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 as they faced a horrible death. And after a couple of months on the Western Front, he had a breakdown and had to go back home. Pack Up Your Troubles was a big hit in Germany, as well as in Britain and America. And in every war since, royalties have poured into the Powell estate. On the eve of World War II, Felix fell into financial trouble, and he shot himself, a sad end for someone who had written such a happy song with his brother a lifetime before. So here's uh, Pack Up Your Troubles, and um, it mentions uh, having a lucifer to light your fag. Once again, cigarettes were what kept everybody going, and a lucifer was a, a, a self-striking match. Get this here. All right. Oh, I thought I might almost do that. There we go. Moment of drama. There. <laughs> All right. 
onto private perks. Private perks is a funny little codger with a smile, a funny smile. Five feet none, he's an artful little dodger with a smile, a funny smile. Flush or broke, he'll have his little joke. He can't be suppressed. In late 1917, doctors at a French hospital camp noticed a new disease with high mortality. 100,000 soldiers passed through that camp every day, so the virus was soon elsewhere. In, in 1917, massive numbers of people were moving around the world, ideal conditions for an illness spread through the air. In the US, the first known case of influenza was recorded on a Kansas army camp. Uh, within days, hundreds of men were sick, and by March, the virus had reached Queens. The first wave seemed like a typical flu, affecting the sick and the elderly. Younger people recovered easily. But in August, a more virulent strain arose in France, Africa, and Boston. This mutated version killed 20% of its victims, mostly the young and healthy. It was called the Spanish flu because Spain was neutral and not censoring its news. And when the flu moved from France to Spain in November, that was the first people heard of it and it seemed like a Spanish thing. But the flu knew no borders. It's estimated that it killed more people than the bubonic plague, the Black Death. In the US, about 28% of the population caught it and 600,000 died, just as in today's epidemic, Native American tribes were hit hard. Entire villages perished in Alaska. In Brazil, 300,000 died, including the country's president. In September 1918, just as the flu arrived in Philadelphia, the city refused to cancel a Liberty Loan parade, and this gathering of 200,000 people led to a huge mortality rate and warned other places to limit crowds. October 1918 was the deadliest month. Schools closed, churches closed, hospitals were overwhelmed, satellite facilities cared for the sick, and in some places, mass graves were dug by steam shovel. Local governments tried to get people to stop spitting in public. Luckily, that's a habit that's no longer with us in the way it was 100 years ago. And they wanted people to wear masks. And most complied, especially when anti-flu measures were framed as a way to protect the troops. The Red Cross ran an ad that said, the man or woman or child who will not wear a mask now is a dangerous slacker. But people fretted that the masks were ineffective and bad for business. An anti-mask league formed in San Francisco. And many people did not wear their masks properly, some poking holes in them so they could smoke. <laughs> people found them hot and stuffy and said that they created an atmosphere of fear. Does all this sound familiar? <laughs> in October 1918, a Seattle Daily Times headline ran, Influenza Veils Set New Fashion. Seattle women wearing fine mesh with chiffon border to ward off malady. These fashionable masks were probably not much good, but neither were the usual ones, which were made of gauze. Children chanted a little rhyme. I had a little bird, its name was Enza. I opened up the window and in flew Enza. Like a little jump rope rhyme. In November, new cases dropped abruptly. The virus may have mutated to a less lethal strain. Life resumed, 
And the 1918 flu did not leave as much of a lasting scar as you would expect. Part of the reason was that the war took up all the attention and flu deaths among young adults blended in with the deaths of so many young soldiers. Also, people back then were more used to epidemics. Typhoid, yellow fever, diphtheria, and cholera were common, and there were no treatments for many conditions we now consider just a nuisance. Death was just a more usual part of life back then. The flu may have tipped the balance of war toward the Allies because it struck the Central Power sooner and more Germans died. Women were mobilized in unprecedented numbers on all sides, taking over many jobs from conscripted men or working in giant munitions factories. Thousands served as administrators, drivers, and nurses. And in 1918, William Tracy and Jack Stern wrote a song about the situation, talking about girls and men, of course, in You Better Be Nice to Them Now. Girls are filling men's positions nowadays and making good at everything they try. They've found out they're useful in a lot of ways. Go get the money is their battle cry. Boys, you got to hand it to the ladies. Here's some good advice for you. You'd better be nice to them now. Oh, you better be nice to them now. Take your sweetie to a preacher right away. She may come in handy for a rainy day. It's all on account of the your job isn't safe anymore for you don't know what may happen in a year or two by then there won't be anything a girl can't do so don't you abuse them or you're bound to lose them you better be nice to them now ever since the nation granted its women's rights they've been preparing so they'll stand the test They've been sitting up and scheming every night and picking out the trade that they like best. Pretty soon the girls will form a union. Then you'll have no chance at all. You'd better be nice to them now. Oh, you better be nice to them now. If you're married, then you needn't be afraid. You'll never have to work if wifey learns a trade. The girls have it all their own way. They're more independent each day. Say, don't be surprised if we have lady cops in time. And if we do, the men will all commit some crime. And when the cops get them, they'll love them and pet them. You better be nice to them now. real time travel piece. <laughs> well, Russian women saw combat as the post-revolution government tried to rouse their demoralized country. Olga Krasilnikov disguised herself as a man and fought in 19 battles in Poland. Natalie Tichmini fought the Austrians, and both were awarded the Russian Cross of St. George. Victoria Savs served in the Austrian army disguised as a man and was awarded the medal for bravery. Dorothy Lawrence pretended to be a man to serve with the British. The most decorated female fighter in the history of warfare was a Serbian woman, Milunka Savic, honored with medals from France, Russia, England, and Serbia. Americans also have a female medal winner. In 1917, a socialite named Julia Hunt Catlin Park Depew Tafleb, <laughs> that's quite a name, turned her French chateau into a 300 bed hospital on the front lines. She had to flee when the action got too close, but returned and was given the Croix de Guerre and the French Legion of Honor. <clears throat> well, in the end, the Central Powers ran out of men and supplies. German morale collapsed and thousands deserted. In Arlington, where I live, news arrived on November 8th that the war was over, church bells pealed, and the fire horn blasted 50 times. 
but the report was wrong. <laughs> so they calmed down the fire bell and everybody sheepishly went back to war. And a few days later, the armistice arrived for real on the 11th hour of the 11th day of the 11th month, which is why Veterans Day falls on November 11th each year, regardless of the day of the week. My grandfather, Anton Taraskowitz, immigrated from the Russian sector of Poland in 1914, fleeing conscription. He became Tony rather than Anton, learned English, saved up a tidy sum working as a weaver in the mill, and became a citizen. He didn't know his birthday, so he chose July 4th. He enlisted, but by the time he was trained and his troop ship arrived in France, the war had just ended, so he joyfully joined in the celebrations and kissed the mademoiselles and ate a lot of oofs washed down with bottles of plonk. <laughs> the post-war period was marked by soaring unemployment, massive strikes, and race riots. There were no financial or educational benefits for returning veterans. A major political issue for groups such as the Veterans of Foreign Wars and the brand new American Legion. The public demanded a return to normalcy and elected Warren G. Harding president, a boring conservative unlikely to meddle in world politics. Well, all those soldier boys were worldly fellows now, and in 1919, Joe Young, Sam Lewis, and Walter Donaldson asked the musical question, how are you going to keep them down on the farm now that they've seen Paris? Said his wifey dear Now that all is peaceful and calm The boys will soon be back on the farm Mr. Reuben started winking And slowly rubbed his chin He pulled his chair up close to mother And he asked her with a grin How you gonna keep him down on the farm My next to last song embodies the era. The words were written at the start of the war in 1914 by an American woman, Lena Gilbert Ford, who had moved to London years before with her mother and son after her divorce. Her poem was set to music by her friend, composer Ivor Novello. In 1918, Lena and her 30 year old son would die in a German air raid. But all through the war, they heard her words everywhere as people searched for a ray of hope. And the song was, Keep the Home Fires Burning. They were summoned from the hillside. They were called in from the glen. And the country found them ready at the stirring call. Let no tears add to their hardships as the soldiers pass along. And although your heart is breaking, make it sing this cheery song. Keep the home fires burning while your hearts are Yearning, though the lads are far away. 
a nation in distress and we gave our glorious laddies honor bad us do no less for no gallant son of freedom to a tyrant's yoke should bend and a noble heart must answer to the same of an entire generation of young men had long-lasting effects. Memorials sprouted everywhere as people tried to make sense of it and at least enshrine their loved ones in memory. In England, a particular remembrance persisted for many years, held on Whit Sunday or Pentecost, the seventh Sunday after Easter when the Holy Spirit descended upon the apostles. Whitson comes from the Anglo-Saxon Saxon word wit or understanding, and also from the traditional wearing of white in, on Pentecost. Now for centuries, Morris dancers dressed in white celebrated Whit Sunday with their ribbons and bells. And traditionally the men did the dancing. But during the war, the men were gone, so the women took it up. Many husbands, sons, and sweethearts never returned. And the women kept dancing in white as a memorial. And Englishman John Austin Marshall wrote this lovely song about it called Dancing at Whitson. And this will be my final song. I want to thank the museum so much for having me and thank you for taking this bumpy journey with me. It's, it's sad, but it's also wonderfully inspiring in many ways. The music that was created is just lovely stuff. And here is Dancing at Whitson. <laughs> It's fifty long springtimes since she was a bride, but still you may see her at each Whitsuntide in a dress of white linen with ribbons of green, as green as her memory.
the sheep used to graze. There's a field of red poppies, a wreath from the queen, but the ladies remember her at Whitson. And the ladies go dancing at Whitson. Thank you.